But then what happens is tunnel vision. And the tunnel vision is powerful. You've got to understand that bad guy has tunnel vision too. A sidestep, rapid lateral movement can take you right off the bad guy's radar screen. So you've got tunnel vision. You've got the auditory exclusion. How could we have had 500 years of gunpowder combat and not let people know ahead of time your shots will be muted? Hello, fellow leaders, and welcome to another episode of the Military Leader Podcast, bringing you conversations with today's most successful leaders. I am Andrew Stedman. Thank you for listening to the podcast today, and thank you to all the people who have left ratings and reviews for the podcast uh, and shared it on social media. I am proud to say that the podcast is closing in on 50,000 downloads and has reached as high as number five on the iTunes category, Government and Organizations. This, this response has been really incredible. And it's all possible because you share the conversations with the other leaders in your life. So thank you so much for doing that. If you haven't been over to the website yet, I'd like to invite you to check out themilitaryleader.com. You can find this episode and all the other podcast episodes there, as well as tons of other leader development content to develop yourself and your team. And when you get there, I ask you to do just one thing. Click the red button in the top right and join the military leader email list. When you do, I'll send you a copy of 40 questions that will challenge your leadership. It's a PDF I built to challenge leaders to think about their effectiveness in new ways and inspire change. And I've got it just for you. So head over to the military leader.com, sign up on the email list and check it out. Okay. This week's guest brings an incredibly relevant conversation for our military and our society. If you are in the military and want to understand the effects of combat, this episode is for you. If you are a police officer or a first responder who must be ready for high-stress encounters at any moment, this episode is for you. If you're a civilian and concerned about the level of violence in our society, this episode is also for you. Retired Army Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman wrote the book on killing, literally. His books on killing and on combat detail the psychological and physiological effects of killing, and effectively own the field of killology. I remember reading On Killing as a Cadet back in 1999. Knowing that I would serve as an infantryman, I read it with a desperation to understand what happens to the body in combat. I specifically remember asking myself, what's going to happen to me when the bullets start flying? How will I respond? How will I continue to lead? These questions plagued me, and I found that On Killing and then later On Combat gave me a frame of reference with which to rehearse my future combat experiences, and it paid off. Dave Grossman continued to serve the military after active duty through his writing and travels to hundreds of bases, posts, and precincts to teach the effects of violent events. Simply put, Dave's work has made an entire generation of service members and first responders more prepared for the violence that they are called to engage in. And in this chat, I asked Dave to go into detail about what happens in the body during a stressful event like a combat engagement. My intent was for this episode to be a summary of the physiological and psychological effects of killing and combat and a resource you can use to teach it to your team. If your untested soldiers aren't aware that during combat, they will experience visual distortion and auditory exclusion, then play this episode for them. If they don't know that they will likely lose bladder control during combat, listen to Dave talk about it in the first few minutes of this chat. And if they don't know how important it is to talk to each other after a traumatic combat experience, I encourage you, as the leader, to share this resource with them. It will pay off. Listen, war is a serious topic, and we are naive to think that the combat experience won't deeply affect us. I'm so thankful that Dave Grossman took some time to share exactly how it will. I hope you enjoy my conversation with retired Army Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman. Uh, Mr. Grossman, Dave, I, I appreciate you taking the time to spend with me and the military leader audience on this Sunday. And thank you so much for everything that you've done for the profession of arms. Uh, that includes law enforcement and the military over the many years that you've been contributing, sir. Hey, thanks, Drew. And the same back to you. You know, we, we talked uh, previously and we talked about just kind of jumping right into uh what I think is the meat of the matter after all this time on the road, interacting with people, be okay if we just dive right into that? 
Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, I, I, uh, I enlisted the 82nd Airborne Division in 1974. And we had, uh, we had combat vets all around us. And we were always ready to punch out. We're going to deploy here, deploy there. We had this sense of imminent combat. And we wanted to know what combat would be like. And we'd ask the, uh, ask the Vietnam vets, and they wouldn't talk. It was kind of a taboo topic. So fast forward, I'm a young infantry captain uh, en route to teach at West Point, going to graduate school. And uh, I, I said, well, I'm going to do my graduate thesis on, on killing, on healthy people killing, not, not sociopaths, psychopaths. And, and uh, you know, I, I would never in a million years have gotten a degree in psychology. And, uh, I just wanted to go to graduate school on the Army's time. And the Army pounded a, a square pig into a round hole. And the kind of guy who had become a psychologist would almost never study the topic of lawful killing. It's not a radar screen. And the kind of person who would uh, study this topic would never really go into that field. So it, it was beneficial. And, and uh, my uh, master's thesis was one chapter of on killing. I, I, I had actually written the whole book in graduate school. And, uh, uh, and I thought that what lie at the heart of combat was the act of killing. I retired from the military, been doing a lot of speaking, a lot of a lot of presentations. And, you know, on, on killing is important from, from one very important perspective. Uh, very critical to our world today. People point to some horrible crimes. Ah, that that proves they're all killers. No, no, that's an outlier. That's one in a million. And you explained to me that 99.9% of our citizens who go a lifetime never kill anybody and never try to. Explain that. Divorce, infidelity, layoff, traffic accidents, road rage. 99.9% of our citizens go a lifetime never kill anybody and never try to. Explain that. That's kind of the hard thing to explain. Inside, inside most he- healthy members of our species is a pretty hardwired resistance against killing their own kind. Uh, uh, sociopaths don't have that resistance. Healthy people have to be trained to kill. And that was the real heart of on combat. Our modern training has evolved to where we make killing a condition response. It's not even on the radar screen anymore. It's, it's just not an issue. Uh, and for those who fully prepared themselves, killing is just not that big a deal. Uh, I retired from the Army in uh, ninety eight. Uh, actually, December '97, and uh, and I've been on the road ever since. I, I trained military and law enforcement in all 50 states. Every federal agency had the honor to work with lots of our military, and my presentation evolved. Uh, what I found out was that these these mature individuals, you know, uh, who have prepared themselves for a lifetime, who killing somebody that's a clear and present danger to others, just not that big a deal. What's really important. Is a forewarn and forearm thing of people about how your body responds, the uh, sympathetic nervous system arousal, the adrenaline dump. Uh, how you respond afterwards depends what you do with that dump. You know, if, uh, if you're a cop and you resolve the issue with a couple of five pound trigger pulls, you got all that adrenaline p- pumping through you and you're going to have trouble sleeping that night. So a good hard workout uh, could be a value. If you're a, a military and you got eight hours of grueling combat, as soon as the danger has gone, boom, you crash. You can barely stay awake. But that sympathetic nervous system arousal, what we want to do is we want to limit that. And in a nutshell, PTSD is every time you remember it, you relive it. And so uh, what I found out was really important. And I, I, I believe I've talked to more people who have been in combat than anybody in history. Uh, before I retired, all the research and then uh, 21 years on the road, every day I talk to some cop who's been in a deadly force incident. Every day I get an email from somebody organized by subject. And, uh, and at the heart of the matter is a couple of things. First off, survivor guilt. And I want to make this real clear. Survivor guilt is not PTSD. It's, it's grieving. It's loss. It's hard. But it's normal. Uh, don't get PTSD mixed up with grieving. Uh, in the normal cycle of life, we will all bury our parents. Is there anything more normal than parents that die before their kids? It, it's normal. It's almost universal, but it's hard. In most people's lives, the hardest thing you'll ever do is to bury your parents. And, uh, and uh, among warriors, uh, the, the bond is so so powerful, and the grieving process is necessary, and we do a good job of taking care of that. But it's really important to not get those mixed up. Chaplains and others know how to deal with grieving. Post-traumatic stress disorder is every time you remember it, you relive it. And the path to healing is to remember it without reliving it. And so we do our critical incident, we do our debriefing. You know, we, we know that 
in a training environment, the majority of the learning happens afterwards in the AAR. How much more so should we capture the lessons learned in a real life event? And so we do our AAR, call it a debriefing. It's not a a touchy-feely term. It's a military term, best I can figure it. uh, It began with World War I. Pilots went on a mission, they're given a mission brief, came back to the mission, they were given a debrief. It's a military term. Um, we, the psych community has kind of grabbed it for themselves. We talk about what happens. And here's one, one key new critical ingredient. Uh, you, you know, I'm a West Point psych professor, and the top psych minds and the top military minds put their heads together. What do we want every West Point officer to know about psychology? And right at the top of the list, it's a concept of sympathetic nervous system, parasympathetic nervous system. Parasympathetic nervous system is uh, digestion and, uh, and tissue regeneration. And, and it, 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 your heart rate and your blood pressure, they all fall into the realm of, of parasympathetic. Sympathetic nervous system is, uh, you know, what, what we told the cadets at West Point, think of, think of the parasympathetic nervous system as being all the cooks and clerks and bakers and mechanics in your unit. When you're asleep, your unit's on stand down. You're in barracks maintenance and motor pool. You don't even guard at the front gate. Some guys that are doing the maintenance and they're still doing their job, and you're cruising along, and somebody tries to kill you. Boom. Total sympathetic nervous system arousal. You know, folks and clerks and bakers and mechanics, they drop their pencil, they drop their wrench, they drop their spoon, they grab a rifle, they get in the front lines, and that's that, and that, that, that over, over arousal. Is, um, is 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 this, this this spike? You go all the way up, and then boom, all the way down. The further you go up, the further you go down. So stress inoculation. One of the one of the one of the great things we've learned in, in 16 years of war is stress inoculation, force on force engagements, realistic training. And and if if we don't go all the way up, if we remain calm in the heat of battle, then we don't go all the way down, and there is no PTSD. Mm-hmm. Well, I have a question. Um, if you don't, if you don't mind, you mentioned you retired in 1998, and then three years later, the 9/11 attacks happened. D- having known so much about uh, killing and the uh, physiological and psychological effects of the combat experience, and you saw the country go into war once again, d- did you see what was coming? I mean, did you know that we were about to to wade into a difficult uh, and traumatic uh, physiological and, and psychological experience for the army and other services? You know, uh, when I first started going out to uh, uh, the uh, Commander General Staff College, uh, we had our young majors, and it was early in the war, and they always had a question and answer session. And in the first couple of years, the one question was, can we maintain this opt-in? Can we maintain this? In just a couple of years, that went away. I remember Ollie North, a uh, uh, guy considered to be a personal friend. Uh, I remember him... Uh, during the invasion of Iraq, saying this will be the first war in which we don't have PTSD. We're, we're taking better care of the troops and know what to do. And, uh, and so what I want you to understand is, is something pretty important. When I teach my classes, you've heard, uh, you've heard 22 veterans a day take their life. You've heard that. But did you know of that 22, only one or two are from the current war? Did you know that? Of course there's other wars. You know, if, if when, you go, when you go to the... Uh, the uh, 80 and 70 year old guys, they're all veterans. Uh, they, they, they were drafted. Elvis Presley was a veteran. The term veteran refers to anybody who served in the armed forces. And, and that 22 veterans a day is a lie of omission. The best we can tell that's probably accurate, but it, it, it includes all those Vietnam veterans, all those World War II vets, those Korea vets, and everybody else who ever served in the armed forces and were drafted for two years like Elvis Presley. Now, and so you understand it. And, and, what ratio of our veterans contract PTSD? You used to be had to dig for this data. Now it comes right up. Go to the Veterans Administration website, uh, search for PTSD in Iraq and Afghanistan. 11% of the people who did not deploy have PTSD. 16% of the folks who did deploy have PTSD. About 5% contract PTSD. The British study of their troops in Iraq, 5%. The uh, Dutch study of their troops in Afghanistan, about 5%. Uh, uh, you know, 11% of the people that don't deploy have it. You can make a general argument, and 5% of the, uh, the ones who deployed contract it. You can make a pretty good argument. Life in America screws up twice as many people as, uh, as a combat. There's about 10% of the population out there. You push the red button, and you get a post-traumatic response. 
So this, this, I keep running into veterans who think there's nothing wrong with them because there's nothing wrong with them. I, uh, I presented at uh, national, international psych conferences, a British psychiatrist and sent me an email. He said, Dave, I, I keep hearing them. No, the American are running 40% PTSD or more. That, uh, the British troops are running 5%. What's the difference? The difference is lying dirtbags in the media. This idea that our veterans are homicidal, suicidal, PTSD-riddled nutcases. But the truth is just the opposite. A new greatest generation is coming home. And, uh, you know, the, this myth of them all being suicidal, one suicide is too many. And by the way, the, the, the elephant in the living room, the great task that lies before us, and we should cover it at the end, is sleep management. Sleep deprived people up to five times more likely to take their life. Whether or not you've been to combat is no predictor of our suicide in the military. Sleep deprived people can be up to five times more likely to take their life. We're, we're in the middle of an epidemic of sleep deprivation in our entire civilization. It's a key factor in our suicides. It's a key factor in traffic fatalities, opiate abuse. Uh, chronic sleep deprivation creates pain. You're sleep deprived. The muscles never relax. The tendons never relax. You've got chronic pain. Opiates are not new. We don't have an opiate epidemic. We have a sleep deprivation epidemic and, a, and an impaired judgment. After sleep deprivation creates impaired judgment, Doc, I'm always in pain. Give me a pill to fix it. <laughs> you get some sleep. You need to get some freaking sleep and show some dang discipline. But the, but, but the video games are horrendously addictive. A constant interactive feedback loop to make the video games as addictive as humanly possible. The, uh, the, the social media, millions of people filter out the single most interesting thing and it flows to the surface and it's the most irresistible, interesting, dynamic video. Social media is so addictive. Uh, the games are so enormously more so addictive every year. You know, I, I recall, uh, I recall back in 2000 and, uh, 2007 and eight during the surge in Iraq. And we, you know, we were writing, writing Baghdad and Anami in a bad spot there. And, and I recall in the evening seeing soldiers playing video games, uh, that they, that we had on, on the cop there. And, and they, they cited, they stated that it was a way to come down off of the, the rush of the day and a, and a patrol and, and I, in my mind, and I wasn't really strong enough to in, enforce this back then. And I, I didn't really resonate with me strong enough, but today it does. And if we're in a similar situation, I'll have a different leadership philosophy on this. But I, I think that, that you got, you got to, you got to cut it off and go to sleep. Exactly what you said, sir. Yeah. Cause you're, you're so much more effective if you can sleep. Well, what the video games do is they keep them on that edge. They never get a chance to ramp back down again throughout human history, the night of the battle, we sat around the fire and we talked, usually with a beer in your hand. You know, that, uh, and, and it comes back to that doing the critical incident debriefing. And we put a bottle of water in front of everybody. And every time somebody starts to lose it, they take a big swig of water. Remember that parasympathetic processes I was telling you about? Digestion, taking a drink of water, a deep breath. These are all parasympathetic processes. These are ways to come down off the high. But the video games keep them at a constant high and create sleep deprivation. You got the blue light coming off of that of that video game screen. You can't ramp down. Uh, this is this is bad juju. You know, we, we and then we sit. You know, we sit around the fire and we talk, and we, maybe with a beer in your hand. Whiskey is made for sipping. Wine's made for sipping. Beer is made for gulping. And then you talk over beer and you begin to lose it. What do you do? Big swig of beer. You know, regain control and keep talking. We do our our CISM, all your, all your leaders out there, do that debriefing after combat. Set everybody on the table. Do it just like an AAR. Do it by the numbers of one addition. Put some water in front of everybody, a bottle of water, ideally, and every time they become emotional, make them stop, take a big swig of water, and regain control. And the, the very first time, you remember it, PTSD, every time you remember it, you relive it. The very first time they start to relive it, stop and 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 take that swig of water and bring it, bring that body back down again, and retain that calm. Uh, and and so the video games, the sleep deprivation is so horrendously destructive. But the, but the model is out there that our troops are suicidal, uh, homicidal, which is totally untrue. The returning veterans must have death is likely to commit a violent crime as a non-veteran. Uh, suicidal, homicidal, PTSD riddled in our case, or tooth is just the opposite. About 5% contract PTSD, and most people don't even know that. We've got all kinds of crazy numbers in our head. And, and of that 5%, 
we're darn good at treating it. Uh, Marcus Luttrell has a podcast called Team Never Quit, Lone Survivor. Marcus Luttrell. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. I've heard it. Uh, I was on his podcast a while back and got his permission to talk about him. Across all these years, couldn't talk about him. Now I can. Uh, I, I, uh, I trained Marcus Luttrell's unit before and after the incident. Post-traumatic stress is like being overweight. Post-traumatic stress disorder is like being obese. We all know the difference between overweight and obese. And, po- and Marcus Luttrell's doc told me that he came back for that incident and he was 500 pounds PTSD. Totally debilitated. A year later, he was 50 pounds PTSD. He wanted to deploy into this unit and he did. And it was a good thing. And, uh, and I told him at the time, I said, look how far you've come in just the last year. Have confidence you can come farther. The day Marcus Luttrell tells us he is 100% post-traumatic stress free and stronger for the experience. It took years, and it wasn't easy. But if that man could come out the other end completely free of post-traumatic stress, anybody can. We've got to understand that post-traumatic stress is com- post-traumatic stress disorder is completely treatable. But we want to start at the very beginning. And just having this physiological arousal and just re-experiencing the event is not PTSD. You know, when something happens and your heart is pounded and you, and you re-experience the event, it's not PTSD. It can become PTSD, depending on how you deal with it. Right. Yes, sir. And I'd like to ask you um, about those effects specifically. Uh, so if, if you can, I'd like to throw a vignette, vignette at you. So let's suppose that uh, we've got a 19-year-old infantry soldier. He's on his first deployment to Afghanistan, and, and he's on patrol, and uh, he receives fire. He and his platoon receive fire from a mud wall compound. So the platoon executes an attack on the compound, and as he breaches the outer door, he comes into an open area, and an enemy fighter is there with a raised rifle. 15 feet away, he's got the drop on him. So in that moment, our soldier, you know, he identifies the threat. He raises his rifle to engage. I'd like for you to explain a bit about what is happening inside his body in that moment when he's about to pull the trigger. All right. And what we got is a total sympathetic nervous system arousal. And I mean, and, and to the degree, in one study in World War II, 20%, roughly 20% of the veterans of, of intense combat in World War II admit they mess themselves in the heat of battle. Uh, about half of all the veterans in World War II would admit they'd wet themselves. These are the ones who admit it. One old World War II vet told me one, one time he said, hell, all that proves is 80% were liars because it happened to him. Now, it's not happening in today's war. It's much more rare because of the stress inoculation, the realistic simulators, the force-on-force engagements. But understand that this sympathetic arousal can be so horrific. And among those who are in traffic accidents, uh, messing themselves is very common, and people are devastated by it. And I train EMS. I train EMS by the by the tens of thousands, I, and I train uh, hospital staff. And when somebody's messed themselves or wet themselves, you tell them this is your body's natural response. It happens all the time. Don't worry about it. You literally save somebody's life by telling them that. So here's what's happening: the body goes into vasoconstriction, the outer layer of the body shuts down all blood flow. The shutout is at the pre-capillary stage. The arteries and the body core can be holding up to twice as much blood. The face goes white. Your fine motor control goes out. The outer layer of the body becomes a layer of armor. Your, your skin is cold and clammy because the body's holding all the blood inside. Unless you hit the artery, in the heat of battle, you won't bleed out. So what the body and, and every, the body has this toxic waste site called the colon. And it's in an overpressure mode. The colon can almost spasm shut and eject what's in there. The bladder can almost spasm shut. In males, the scrotum sucks up and the, and the, and the testicles suck up tight. The, the, the blood comes out from the outer layer of the body. These are all stress responses. But then what happens is tunnel vision. And the tunnel vision is powerful. You've got to understand that bad guy has tunnel vision too. A sidestep, rapid lateral movement can take you right off the bad guy's radar screen. So you've got tunnel vision. You've got the auditory exclusion. How could we have had 500 years of gunpowder combat and not let people know ahead of time your shots will be muted? Now, it's interesting. Hunters don't hear the shot. In combat, people hear the shot, but it's very muted. You'll hear the brass hit the ground. You'll hear everything around you, but the actual shots are muted. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, what I tell people, we now know, and this is this constant evolution as a Conducted these interviews, we can say without a doubt 
The shutout is in the nerve. The ears are still being hammered. Wear hearing protection when you hunt. Be a deaf old geezer like me, it's a pain in the butt. So the audit exclusion, the tunnel vision, the slow motion time. I have had hundreds of people tell me they can see the bullet in combat, and I believe them. It's like airsoft, when the bullets okay. come, you track with your eyes. Right. In several cases, people were able to walk up. Cops walked up and pointed where the bullet hit. No way they could have done that. They weren't tracking them with their eyes like they said they were. One of the one of the critical things that happens is memory gaps. You know, uh, uh, 2016 was the single worst year-over-year increase in cops murdered in the history of our nation. Every year, cops have better tactic, better training, better body armor. The only good assessment of the, of the measure is the year-over-year increase in cops murdered. Uh, five cops murdered in Dallas, four cops murdered in Baton Rouge. The single most horrendous year-over-year increase. But they also That's have... Sad. Yeah, very sad. Yeah, very sad. Whole different topic. Yeah. You also have bad guys go to the cop's house to murder their family. But mama bear protecting her cubs, one of the most dangerous things on the planet. Better put a load of double up buck in the bad guy's face, game over. I tell people, you know, we, we carry a pistol because a rifle's pain in the butt and hard to conceal. We in your home front, you choose the weapon. You're a, you're a bird hunter, and they were. Use your, some version of your trusty bird gun, and she did. And she said, you know what messed me up? She said, I heard the audio recording of my 911 call. And to this day, I have no memory of making that call. Oh, wow. it, it was eating me alive. She said, and then she said, somebody gave me your book. Said, look at page 55. <laughs> it's normal. It's normal. One of the most healing words on the planet is normal. So we need to know about these things ahead of time. Another thing that happens is memory distortions. About one out of five trained cops in a life and death event remember something that did not happen. It was early It was early in the war. One of our tier one spec ops medics at his first combat tour uh, came to me and said, he said, why did the wounded hallucinate so much? They remember things that did not happen. So just set aside the fact that somebody's trying to kill you. Set aside all that. Boom. All of a sudden, <laughs> tunnel vision. <laughs> or exclusion. <laughs> Blackouts. Uh, 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 hallucinations. That would meet every definition of a psychotic episode. Not everybody experiences all of those. But many, many people experience some assortment of those. And I'll give them to you in the sequence, which is most common. Vision, auditory exclusion, slow motion time, memory gaps, memory distortions. So if, if you're warned about these things, then they won't blindside you. And if you've been stress inoculated with force on force type engagements, then you won't have that overwhelming response. You won't lose bowel and bladder control, although our wounded still do. And it's OK. It's normal. But even more important than warning people about all of that is what happens afterwards. You expect crazy things in the heat of battle. A week later, a month later, boom, all of a sudden you're re-experiencing the event. Something pushes that button. Your heart's pounding. You're gasping for air. You wake up out of dead sleep with the, believe in your incoming artillery. That is not PTSD. It's normal. Uh, you know, you're, you're one I'm, group of Marines gave me a nice feedback loop on, and I trained the whole battalion. Uh, Marines said, uh, we were talking over beer with our buddies and, uh, we talked about the puppy coming for a visit. I call that midbrain, the puppy brain, the dog that we all, that we all have in there. And the puppy comes for a visit. You know, you touch a hot stove, boom, from that point on, you know, never touch the stove again. That's one trial learning. How much more so should these kind of neural networks be established in combat? So he said, we're talking about, uh, uh, about the puppy coming for a visit. One guy said, I, it happened to me. He said, I, I've been home for less than a week, dead asleep in bed by my wife. They emptied the dumpster right outside our apartment. Sounds like incoming artillery. <laughs> he said, I wake up out of a dead sleep, heart pounded, roll out the bed, hit the deck. I'm scrambling under the bed for rifle and helmet that's not there. And I come up armed with my slippers. And we all laugh. And we had a beat. And one of my buddies said, it happened to me. Not the real common one. Been home less than a week or been home for a couple of weeks. Walking down a busy city sidewalk with a wife and kids. A car backfired. Boom. Next thing I know, I'm in the gutter under a car. Look up, there's the wife and kids. Look at me, the eyes that big. I said, ah, it's okay. Hmm. This is normal. We're warned this might happen. <laughs> right. And, and that's the best. And they were prepared for it. Yeah. And, 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 and we laughed. And then he said, and then he said, one of my buddies said something really important. He said, you know, if we hadn't been warned this might happen, we wouldn't be laughing. 
we hadn't been warned this might happen, we wouldn't be laughing. They feel shame about it, probably. Yeah, well, yeah, and, and just the fear of experiencing some weird thing you've never experienced any time in your life, and the thought that you're losing your mind. I can lose my legs, I'm still me. If I lose my mind, I'm not me anymore. But when you re-experience that event, if, if nobody warned you that this is your body's natural response, but to be able to laugh about it is just one of the best things you could possibly do. And even if it does become full-blown post-traumatic stress disorder, it is fully treatable. We have hundreds of thousands of cases we treated and recovered fully. So we, we've got to let people know that even if it does meet the, the full classification of PTSD and in my book on combat, you know, on killing, I thought it was about killing. And I realized that for those that fully prepare themselves, on killing is very valuable from an academic standpoint, very interesting. But on combat is infinitely more important. Uh, all the things I just told you about in on combat and much more to be forewarned and forearmed about these things, to send a generation that's going into warfare, you know, after 500 years of gunfighter combat, who knows that the shots are probably going to be muted with some exceptions. We are caught surprised in an ambush. Boom, boom, boom. Shots overwhelming. Go to shoot back. Shots get quiet. Well, with all that, uh, with all that going on in in the combatant, you know, the soldier here is engaging an enemy fighter. With all of those things happening, what what comes through? Like, how is he able? What performance comes through? Is is it the training that he's that he's trained reflexively, and in that moment, it's able to come through when everything else is going on? Absolutely, and that's and that's where it kind of brings us back to uh, uh, on killing and mentioned a little bit on combat. Is this dynamic? That, uh, that you're like a pilot in a flight simulator. You're like a kid in a fire drill. You do exactly what you're conditioned to do. And uh, you, we've, we've had that pop-up target in training. That target pops up, boom, boom, you engage it. We've got photorealistic targets. We've got realistic simulators. We've made killing a conditioned response. Remember, healthy people have to be trained to kill. Now, the average person will go a lifetime, 99.9% .9 of our population never kill anybody and never tried to. Killing has is, is, is got to be learned, and modern training makes it a, a conditioned response. And oh, by the way, <laughs> the video games are doing the exact same thing to the kids. I was at the president's roundtable in the White House in February, uh, the Parkland killer. They murdered 17 people in that high school. The neighbor said all that kid did was, was 15 hours a day play violent video games. The most all-consuming, all-pervasive thing in this kid's life is video games, the murder simulators. So we can take the lesson of the battlefield. To understand when you're scared out of your witch, when you have no idea what to do, boom, you do what you're conditioned to do. And as a result of that, you survive. But we can understand the same thing is happening out there. The, the, the killer in Texas with 10 dead, the killer in, in Parkland, Florida with 17 dead. Uh, all of these killers, the FBI study of 19 school killers, uh, the, the European study of all their school killers, the worst men in Europe, uh, the all-time record juvenile mass murder in human history was uh, – 15 dead in Vinden, Germany, a seven-year-old high school student, and every single one of them had dropped out of life and immersed themselves in these, these combat simulators, which makes killing a condition response. So the, 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 there is no doubt that the, the, the modern warrior will do what they're conditioned to do. Like a pilot in a flight simulator, training has got it down. Uh, what we got to do is be prepared to live with what we did afterwards. And, and we can condition people to pull the trigger. In Vietnam, we... We sent them to war, we, we enabled them to kill, and then brought them home and attacked them and condemned them. Uh, they called them baby killers, and, and they really were spit on and attacked. It really did happen. In this war, thank goodness it didn't happen. But now instead of being villains, they're victims. They're returning veterans, homicidal, suicidal, PTSD, brittle, bactaceous, with the tooth that's just the opposite. 22 veterans a day take their life. We got a scream from the mountainside. Only one or two are from the current war. And, and, and one's too many. And the new wild card in the equation is this chronic sleep deprivation that, that we must address. The greatest challenge in leaders today is addressing sleep deprivation with all these incredibly subjective and addictive processes. Is sleep is a, is, a, is a combat multiplier. 
Yeah. Yeah. We just went through an NTC rotation down at Fort Irwin a few months ago and, and, you know, the rotations are all decisive action. I mean, it is simulating a state, state on state, uh, high intensity war versus, you know, 10 years ago, it was a wide area security, you know, counterinsurgency fight, which honestly does allow you to, to have a period of patrol and a surge, and then you come back and recover. But, but now we're shaping those training opportunities so that the leaders are tested their The units are tested over and over and over again. And I'll be quite honest. I, I mean, I didn't, I didn't have success with this. Dave, I mean, I, I got uh, at most four hours and more like two just about every night, and it was debilitating. Yeah, and we've got, you know, and, and what I tell people is, you know, and, and I'm a graduate of ranger school. You know, any ranger graduate will tell you about the third day without sleep and having hallucinations and, and, and uh, uh, going without food for days. Ranger school didn't teach me I don't need food. <laughs> ranger school taught me to always have something in my pocket. You know, ranger school didn't teach me I don't need sleep. It taught me what a useless zombie I am without sleep. But but what we do know in in a training environment, when we sleep deprive people, if the real world, you have to do it. Now, sleep deprivation is a leadership failure. Sleep deprivation represents a training leadership management failure. The sufficient time to sleep should be built in. But we all know that the combat doesn't always give us that opportunity. And so uh, um, what we've got to do is is build in an understanding that in a controlled training environment, sleep deprivation is okay. It will inoculate you mentally. We cannot train our body to get by on less sleep, but we can train our mind to not panic when that happens. There are two different things. Physiologically, you need X amount of air, food, water. Psychologically, we can train you to go without food and sleep for a while. But uh, uh, like, let's say um, you're going to be on the range tomorrow. I had a lot of work for the Marine Corps and their training centers. And if, if they're going to have a range day the next day, it is absolutely essential that the troops get a good night's sleep the night before. It is, it is just a, a, a criminal act to put sleep deprived people on the range when, when you had control of that variable. So in a training environment, we sleep deprived people. But the most insidious thing that comes out of that is that expectation that this is how combat will be, that I'm supposed to get four hours sleep a night. And that represents leadership failure of enormous magnitude. After 18 hours without sleep, your impaired judgment equal to 0.08 legally drunk. After 24 hours without sleep, your impaired judgment equal to 0.10 above legally drunk impaired judgment. And that's what we're seeing with these suicides. That's what we're seeing with the drug overdoses. That's what we're seeing with this, this explosion of traffic accidents is impaired judgment caused by sleep deprivation. And, and it's a, it's a, Sleep is a biological blind spot. Our bodies don't know how to do it. It always happened naturally. It got dark. But now we've got artificial lighting and these incredibly addictive video games and social media, cell phone messages and phone calls in the middle of the night. And, and, and so it's a biological blind spot. But the video games and the social media is a social blind spot. If you stagger in the house drunk two o'clock every night, you know you have a problem. You stagger into morning formation, sleep deprived because you played video games all night long. You have a problem. And we need to confront that and people be aware of that. So this this dynamic, like you said, what great training, what awesome training. But but be so careful and, and understand that the major variable that we have to manipulate from a psychological and physiological standpoint is sleep deprivation. We never give the enemy a chance to sleep. We hammer them every 20 minutes. And the minimum nap is about 30 minutes. Anything less than 30 minutes, pretty much a waste of time. Every 20 minutes, hit them with artillery, hit them with mortars, probe his perimeter. But we do that to the bad guy to psychologically destroy him. Don't do it to your own self and your own troops. You know, uh, I, I worked with a, a brigade of the 101st, and for six months, they had zero power. I mean, we, they, had, they just were in a totally primitive environment, the whole brigade. The chaplain told me we had no video games. We had no, you know, we had the cell phones ran out of power pretty quickly. You know, we, 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 we were in a primitive environment and it was amazing. People sat with each other. They drunk, uh, you know, and got sodas. They talked went to bed and they got plenty of sleep. Uh, that's, that's this new environment in which we, we bring all the bad parts from our culture, these addictive processes, these bad habits, this sleep deprivation. And we bring it to the battlefield, and it's the defining challenge of the modern leader to make sure that our troops get sufficient sleep. 
you know, that your comment there overlaps a little bit with what uh, Sebastian Younger wrote about in Tribe when he said it was really the, the, the cohesion and the resiliency of the group that helped mitigate the effects of uh, post-traumatic stress after combat. And, and that's that debriefing. You know, yes, we got a group. Yes, we have cohesion. But we're not applying it unless we sit down and talk about what happened. You know, in Vietnam, we, we, we didn't have debriefings, we, 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 but we did sit over beer and talk. And then they brought them home as individuals, as fat on them. Uh, they, it, Vietnam's an example of how to do a war wrong. Individual replacements, uh, uh, you know, the, the lack of debriefings. The only thing they did right was at least be able to chill out and talk over beer for a few minutes. And then we brought them home and they were attacked and condemned. Uh, so what we've got to do is continue to do those debriefings. Put that bottle of water in front of everybody. Uh, it, laughter is so healthy. Laughter says this has no power over me. But when somebody becomes emotional, stop. Take a big swig of water. Water hits the stomach. Parasympathetic process become ascended. And, uh, and, and you're able to calm yourself down. You can control your heart rate. You can control your blood pressure if you control your breathing or by intaking of, of drinking fluids and pulling down back into that calm realm. And we've got to teach this to people ahead of time. Now, you mentioned um, the role of leaders a second ago there in controlling the sleep. What about in the midst of a combat event, uh, when a, a firefight, maybe even a prolonged firefight, what role can leaders play in uh, helping, uh, you know, the, the, the soldier? You know, I'm thinking of like a captain or, you know, or, or uh, um, you know, maybe a platoon leader and, and his guys are getting after it there. What role can that person play uh, in, in helping them through the combat event? Well, that's, that's such a critical question. S.L.A. Marshall, uh, one of the great pioneers in this field, talked about how on the battlefield there was immediate isolation. When we went to war in in uh, Japan and in Europe, we, our enemy was always chattering. On the battlefield, our enemy was always talking. And, and, and we thought that was kind of naive. These guys were already veterans of many years of war. They knew what was right. Communication, talking to one another. I tell you, there's great power in that leader that comes up behind people, put a hand on their shoulder and says, you know, you're doing a good job. You know, we're here for you. You know, just it, you're doing good. Keep it up. The presence of leaders, you know, the, uh, the phalanx, the, the, you know, the, the phalanx uh, the, the, of spearmen, you know, the Greek phalanx uh, was defeated by the Roman system. And the Roman system of government was, uh, was a dynamic with leaderships behind the line we're constantly there and encouraging and guiding and controlling the battle. You know, you don't really have a, a leadership out front in a Greek phalanx or the, or the Swiss pike, you know, pike hedge. Uh, what we've got today is we've got that open order more than ever. You know, the, the shots fired, you go to ground and suddenly you're alone. You can't see anything. You can't see your friends. You can't hear your friends. And, and there's great value in that leader that just goes from position to position, uh, puts a hand on the shoulder, tells them good work. Hey, you know, uh, second squad is maneuvering left right now, giving some cover fire. Uh, this the presence of the leader is is one of the most in, powerful tools in enabling performance in combat, living with whatever you have to do in combat. My leader was there. My leader uh, 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 it supported and encouraged me to do what I did. My leader approves of what I did. Leadership is that critical glue that holds the unit together. He can't see the guy to his left or his right, maybe. But he can see that leader that comes by and puts a hand on the shoulder and, uh, and talks to him and guides him. Uh, you know, the stack's going in the door and, and, uh, and the leader's standing there tapping everyone on the shoulder as he goes in the door. We're putting the stack in the door and the leader's there smacking everyone on the shoulder or tapping him on the helmet as he goes in. That's leadership, to be there for them, their hour of greatest need. The, the team leader leads from the front. But from that point on, um, in most senses, our, our squad leader, our platoon leaders, uh, they are they are the ones that are kind of the glue that holds it together by moving across that line and communicating across that line and uh, and holding that that unit uh, cohesion together. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I was did a little research uh, for my uh, thesis at the Command and General Staff College in 2011 and my research on the the, uh, the effects of combat on the brain and trying to understand what happens, you know, in the brain during combat. And a lot of your work came up as well as um, um, some of the neuroscience researchers from you know, institutions around the country. And 
I was the the thought was that you know, exactly what you said about distance from the fight. You know, so a a squad leader and a and a platoon leader, and let's say a company commander, they all have varying uh, you know levels of engagement <clears throat> and connection to the the fight that might be going on, and so they're going to experience you know the the event a little differently. But I, I what I concluded when I was when I was looking at this is that they each have a a balance of uh, approaching the fight from an emotional standpoint and an, and a cognitive standpoint because the you know the, the soldier that's in the fight he's going to be a lot of his actions are going to be battle drills that reflexive he's reacting mo- he's going to be emotionally charged but those leaders have more of a cognitive responsibility to step back from that and tamp down some of what you call the puppy you know the, the, the puppy brain calm is contagious and panic is contagious you gave me a great example earlier about uh, an ied going off on one of your patrols and uh, and I, as I recall, you were saying that the the S3 uh, was having trouble believing you because your voice was so calm. Is, is that right? Right. I mean, that's a great example of, of, of the, what we want to manifest as leaders. How do we do that? You know, we're, we're part of that combat, too. How do we stay calm? Big swig of water, deep breath, uh, physiological control of those things. Uh, I, uh, I, I've got a little finger clip. It gives my heart rate. And I'll... Uh, I'll sit and watch TV and run it as high as I can, hyperventilate, run it as high as I can, and then long, slow breaths and bring it down. Right? I went to the dentist, and uh, and my dentist takes my blood pressure. Oh, I said, that's a little high for me. Hold on a second. Take a deep breath, relax every muscle that I can, try it again. Oh, that's magic. Nobody can grow the blood pressure. Yes, you can. <laughs> it's incredibly easy. You've just, you just, you just been told all your life you can't control those things. And breathing is uh, is that tool that we use. And, the, of course, uh, if we can combine that breathing, we're taking a big swig of water. Today we got the camel back on our back. We do a mag change, take a hit off the camel back. It's a calming. We're going in the stack. The last thing we do before we're going to take it off that camel back. That water hits the stomach. It's calming. It's a paraphernalic process. It says, says uh, we, we're, we're, we're safe. We have time to take a drink. And, uh, and so uh, panic is contagious and calm is contagious. And the leader has to be able to manifest that calm. Excitement's okay. Enthusiasm's okay. Uh, we want to be able to communicate some enthusiasm and some excitement if necessary. But that 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 leadership calm is is a solid goal. That's what we strive for, and that's what we need to be able to project on the battlefield. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I tell the, the platoon leaders as they're coming into the job that they have to infuse emotional stability into the organization because you never know how long the fight's going to go. You never know how long or intense it's got to be. So they have to be really the, the barometers for what the platoon should be, uh, you know, should be experiencing. You know, we've got we've got people now that know nothing but 17 years of war. We've got higher level commanders who are extraordinarily uh, well prepared for combat greater than any before in human history. But the young lieutenant who comes straight out of the school and, and goes to the unit, are we doing the right job in raising them? What are you seeing down there in the trenches as far as a current mechanism? Right. That's a great question. I mean, you, you look around the formation and, and five years ago, just about everyone had a, a patch on their right sleeve. And, and nowadays it's it's down to, I think anecdotally, it's down to about 25 percent or less. You know, you see it really, I mean, you have E5s, E6s that haven't had the opportunity to deploy. Um, it, it, w- the one thing that I think we do a really good job of, um, I, I can't really compare it to any other war, but basically for my career, this is, you know, I've known, you know, uh, I, I mean, I've, I've known this war since I've come in the army and we leverage, uh, re- the lessons, the sharing of lessons and the, the, um, and, and bringing in people to talk about it. There's, there's tons of stuff through, you know, as you know, the, the army lessons learned and, and other forums. I know you said you've gone to West point to talk and I know there's their speaker and leader series. So I think that the connectedness that we experience now compared to other wars is helping people prepare for that. Uh, yeah, as you know, you can search on YouTube for, you know, combat Afghanistan and you'll find hundreds of videos that can give you a little bit of insight into that. Um, but I think on, and then additionally, uh, you might've seen that, the army extended uh, the OSIT training, the infantry training, uh, by I think six or eight weeks, and that's to give uh, the the new soldiers uh, a better opportunity to be more physically fit, and then also to give them more time on the range to increase their lethality skills. So I think that's a good move in the right direction. That's reassuring. That's great to hear. You know, at the height of the war, at, at when when Germany was reeling on both flanks, they still kept basic training to its full length, believing that 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 it was necessary to have that amount of time. And, uh, and and it's good to hear that uh, that we've we've even extended that to a degree, uh, uh, and for, for a couple of different reasons. They need that extra time to get physically fit, but 
it's good to hear, you know, from old geezer who's standing back and watching them fight now that uh, good people are out there and uh, we're holding the holding the standard and, and giving them the training that they need and, and passing on those lessons learned and uh, having leaders who have been veterans of combat like you, you know, you've known nothing about war for your whole military career. Those kind of leaders uh, uh, have faith at, at a completely unspoken, unconscious level, have faith in what you personally bring to the battlefield. Your subordinates are looking up to you. You know, my whole military career, Gulf One was four days, Panama was a day, Grenada was a day. If you made them all, and I didn't, they wouldn't add up to a week. Today, we see more in a week than we would have seen in a whole career. And I, I, want, I want to tell you, from an old geezer standpoint, you're making us awful proud. You and the people out there fighting this fight are, are, are doing a magnificent job. And, and uh, you're making our entire nation uh, and all of us old geezers uh, incredibly proud. Just, just well done to all of you leaders out there. Uh, thank you for your service and, uh, and and continuing to strive and rise to the highest, highest standards. And I, there's something that you bring to the table that you probably don't give sufficient credit for. Your people look at you as having been a, a veteran of, of 17 years of war, as they have never known anything but war. There's never been anything like that in American history. And, and, and there's great power that comes with that from an unspoken standpoint. And there, there's great value in, in bringing it up from an unconscious to, to a conscious level. The understanding that uh, this is what I bring to the table that nobody else ever has. This is the credibility, the calm, the, the modeling behavior and, and ability that I bring to the table. All of our leaders out there, uh, have faith in yourself. Have faith in your system. Have faith in our nation. Have faith in our way of life and our military's ability to prepare you. And uh, and to sustain you through this time. And and uh, just after you've been around that block a couple of times, recognize that you've got something going for you. There should be a degree of confidence that uh, my generation would have never known. I, I had a I had a, a sergeant major, one that the Distinguished Service Cross in Vietnam. He had he had six one year tours in Vietnam, and it was it was his. He was a platoon leader, young E six platoon leader in Vietnam on his fifth on his fifth tour, five years straight in combat. Married a local, just went, just went native, and stayed there for six years. But he he said uh, he said I, w- I was maneuvering. I had four radios going. I was maneuvering a platoon. Uh, I, I mean, he was a platoon defense of an airfield. He said uh, I had uh, I, I, I had uh, fast movers. I had attack helicopters. I had mortars. I had artillery. I was maneuvering my platoon, and it was just another day at the office for me. And that's what we're seeing. It's an incredible thing. Uh, and uh, so we've got to, how, how do we, you know, how do we manipulate that as a, uh, as a combat multiplier and apply it to the best? And the first step is to bring that from unconscious to conscious awareness and to start openly uh, seeking and, and dealing with that and, and, and seeing the potential problems because fatigue sets in, but also seeing the potential value that comes out of that. I got a whole handful of questions from folks connected to the military leader audience. And uh, so I asked them on, on, on Facebook and Twitter to, uh, to throw out some questions for you here. And, and I got a, a trend of folks asking about really what's changed, you know, since you, know, you wrote on killing and then, you know, someone uh, mentioned SLA Marshall, you know, the data was, you know, it's tough to get good data back then. And I, and I, and you've you've hit on this throughout your comments a couple points here and there about how we we're so much better than we were you know back then but how how it, has it evolved uh, and if you were to write another on killing today uh, what would be different about it you know we, we I did a, a second edition of on killing uh, a while back and I, I tried to put it in almost a timeless tense and and it it's been put to bed uh, on combat is really the next evolving step after on killing now, the, now, on killing is pretty much done, but on combat, uh, the uh, the last edition of on combat currently out is the third edition. The audio book is actually the fourth edition. I was able to tune it up for the audio. And I've got reams of information that someday, someday down the road, when I, when I finally get a chance, I, I'm in four or five, six cities a week on my daily job training. It, but someday I'm going to turn around and do a, what will be essentially a, a fifth edition, the, the audio book being the fourth edition which we integrated in all these great case studies, all these examples. But I tell you, on combat has hit the point where there's not too many surprises out there. I mean, little things like uh, closing the loop on the Marcus Luttrell story, uh, things like uh, uh, knowing now, knowing without a doubt that auditory exclusion happens in the nerves, 
and that the ear is still being hammered, the ear is still getting hearing loss. Those are the nuts and bolts pieces that are falling into place that I'll be able to weave into some future Jitterbug combat. But I, I think there, there's not a whole lot out there that's fundamentally new that we haven't already identified. This sympathetic nervous system arousal, this uh, auditory exclusion, this slow motion time, and you know, and then the application of that, that lateral movement can take you right off the bad guy's uh, radar screen when he's got tunnel vision. And, and I, 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 I worked with a, a police officer uh, at the Draw of the Prophet Muhammad Art Festival at uh, Dallas, Texas, May of 2015, because they'd be more provocative. The Draw of the Prophet Muhammad Art Festival. They're afraid it brought bad guys. It did. Two art critics from Arizona showed up. They had the element of surprise. They had body armor. They had rifles. And a 59-year-old traffic cop with a pistol killed them both. Incredible act of valor. Incredible act of marksmanship. But he, uh, from 40 feet away, he, he, he drew and fired at the first bad guy. Uh, put him down, sidestepped, and, and came right off the second bad guy's radar screen. 30 rounds of rifle fire was shot. Over 30 rounds of AK-47 fire, never hit once. He hit with virtually every shot he was firing. And, and that brings us back around to uh, to the, the whole dynamic of, uh, of, of uh, you know, sidestepping and, and, the, and the value of, you, uh, the, of uh, uh, the, the, the utility, if you will, of, of lateral movement on the battlefield when... Uh, uh, when the bad guy's got tunnel vision and how he was able to manifest this incredible victory. So this, this information is getting out there and uh, we're, we're disseminating it to the best of our ability. Uh, but uh, there's not a whole lot more that's really coming out of it. Uh, if there was some horrendously critical dynamic thing that had to be in a new edition of On Combat, I would do it. Mm-hmm. Maybe that speaks to the, the universal nature of the um, you know, the, the stress or the death experience or the threat of death on the human body. I think, yeah, it, I think so. you hit a pretty good baseline with, with on combat there. Yeah, we'd hope so. But again, there's, there's just vast numbers of nuts and bolts and case studies that I, I dearly want to put back in, uh, in there somewhere along the line, just to make it more interesting and, and just to create a greater depth of information. There's just not a whole lot new out there that I've been able to find. Uh, uh, you know, I, I love it when a new piece falls into place. You know, I, I've talked a lot about two different, types of combat. One is a charging lion, tunnel vision. He's a heat seeking missile lives, totally focused on his prey. The other is the wolf pack response, which we have situational awareness and, and we know everything around us. And, and uh, those are the two models. You know, you talk about your young private, your 19 year old private who uh, we, we began the discussion with, what's he going to have tunnel vision, auditor exclusion, uh, but maybe he's that, that individual that already and I, we see this later in careers, has that wolf pack response. You know, in the wolf pack, everybody knows where everybody else is. They're conscious. They're aware. They're working as a unit. Uh, and as we move up to higher levels of leadership, we want to strive for more of that wolf pack dynamic. And I think I'd uh, spend more time talking about that. You know, the, the leadership principle that comes to mind that uh, when you said that is the motto of uh, the first company that I had, um, Charlie Rock and, and one five infantry and back in 2005 and six. And the, the motto was dominate. And we, it, as, as we discussed the, the motto, uh, a mindset came really emerged out of that. You know, when you, as the American soldier, when you step onto a battlefield or you step onto an objective, you know, it's crucial to have the mindset that, that we that we own it that we are there to take charge and to inflict uh, violence if necessary, but to inflict our will on whatever is on that objective and not the other way around. And unless, unless a soldier, uh, cause basic training won't do it. I don't think, but unless a soldier is really taught to believe that he is the force of change um, that can take control of a situation and a- apply violence um, as necessary to do just about whatever, whatever he needs to, then the, he could leave something off the table. You know, he can, he cannot give it everything and can have, you know, that fear. And, um, I think that walking into a combat, knowing that you're bringing a heck of a lot within infantry platoon, you may feel some things that are uncomfortable and you may go through this, these physiological changes, but at the end of the day, you know, like you said, you've got buddies on left and right who are taking charge of that terrain and, and uh, are it's certainly in the last, uh, you know, 16, 17 years of war have emerged victorious off of every objective we've seen. In that stuff that, you know, how many times has the, the media said that we're doomed and members of Congress said that we're doomed. Here they are uh, 17 years later. And, you know, I, I tell most of my audience that uh, 
you know, four years into this war, there was nobody left to enlist before the war got stuck with the war. And nobody's been drafted into this war. The last time we fought a war with 100 percent wartime volunteers was the American Revolution. Starting in 1812, we always had people enlisted before the war got stuck with the war. But the longer was, we always had the draft. These guys are just absolutely magnificent. Uh, and, and they're still in there, you know, uh, uh, you know, one one person can do a lot of harm. Back during the days of Abu Ghraib, or, you know, that prison in Iraq, those photographs, I heard one young soldier, one young soldier back in those days, uh, training a unit, he said, uh, the seven idiots have lost the war for us. We ain't lost that war. They're, Iraq's still hanging in there. But Abu Ghraib is still a model of how just a handful of bad people can and do us enormous harm in this war. But, uh, we're still there. We're still hanging in there. And uh, and our nation is still standing behind them. And in spite of that, that the voices of failure in the media year after year, you know, it, uh, yeah, it would be nice for them to root for us for once. Eat, root for your own side for once. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Well, before we run out of time here, I, I do want to ask you a question that has really been uh, burning uh, in my mind since uh, I found out we had the opportunity to talk. And I'll, a, a 10 second story here is that I'll, I mean, I'll share with you that this, this year is the first time that I started uh, carrying a concealed weapon in church. And it's not something that I took lightly. I considered it ahead of time, but really, you know, looking around at the nature of events in, in the, in the United States and particularly the United States, because you don't see these events across the world in the same way that you do here. Um, I made the decision to do that and it's caused me to question you know, is it, is it necessary? Is it, is, is this the way to fix the problem? And so while on the one hand, I feel like I have to be ready for what comes and especially being a, you know, a soldier and a tactician, I, I want to be ready uh, if, if something comes around. But, but secondly, you know, I want to ask you, sir, like what, what's the answer to, to all this? Cause simply everyone, you know, everyone defending themselves and strengthening their own foxhole isn't going to solve the problem. At least I don't think so. I mean, what, what do you think the future is for us in, in, in America and violence? I'm glad you mentioned that. My, my latest book is called Assassination Generation. It came out from a major publisher uh, just, just, uh, just about a year before the Parkland school massacre. And of course, this other school massacre, I, I put a pres- I put a copy in the president's hand and, and I was a member of his round table on violent video games that assassination generation really looks at the problem. You know, the, the number of murdered people underrepresents the situation, just like on the battlefield, because medical technology is saving ever more lives. I mean, it's, that's another of those flat forehead, no brainer things. Uh, uh, UMass Harvard study, if we had 1970s medical technology, the murder rate would be four times what it is every year. Medical technology saving lives. The number of dead people underrepresents the problem. So what I tell people, you know, we do we do our House of Worship security team training nationwide. Go to sheepdogseminars.com. And uh, we do this House of Worship security training. And we tell them, you know, your House of Worship has a fire exit, has a fire alarm, has fire extinguishers. And, uh, you know, we prepare for fire. And, uh, you know, people say, you know, when we talk about violence, don't think God will protect you. Won't, won't God protect you from fire? You know, <laughs> turn off that fire exit sign. Throw away that fire extinguisher. Show us your faith. That, that's not how it works. You know, uh, uh, God put you there to protect them. And, uh, and every year. Uh, we've had more people killed in houses of worship in America than schools year after year after year. Uh, and this last year was, was one of the worst years in school and it's one of the worst years in our houses of worship with 26 dead in Sutherland Springs. And uh, before we had nine dead in Charleston, South Carolina, which was the record American mass murder in houses of worship. And by the way, the, these things are happening around the world. We just we just don't hear about it much. Uh, it, it, we've seen attacks on houses of worship across Asia, across Latin America. Uh, of course, it's one of the, the, the manifestations of that uh, Islamic world is these attacks on houses of worship with, uh, with hundreds dead. And, uh, but I, I, I tell you, uh, we've got to recognize the fact that, that we know how to empower people to kill. We know that what modern training does, and we've got to recognize that video games are doing the same thing. And we're the only major industrialized nation on the planet now that doesn't regulate children's access to violent video games. And uh, uh, this, I'm not a big guy in laws. I'm a laid back, leave me alone, or leave you alone kind of guy. When it comes to laws saying you can't have sex with my grandkids, I'm good with that. When it comes to laws saying you can't sell alcohol or, 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 or firearms to my grandkids, I'm good with that. 
And they wouldn't buckle their baby in their car seat if it wasn't the law. If you'd have told my mom, buckle those five kids up, she said it wasn't possible. If the law proof it, done. So what, what people say is, well, if these, these games were any harm, it'd be against the law. They're right. So in my book, Assassination Generation, I talk about how the, the state of California, home of Silicon Valley, home of Hollywood, California overwhelmingly voted, like every other major developed nation, to regulate children's access to these games. And the video game industry fought them all over the Supreme Court. And they conned seven old men, seven Supreme Court justices, probably never played Pong in their life, overturned the California law. And uh, the video game industry said, you cannot regulate us. We can sell any game to any kid at any age, at, at, and you cannot regulate us or stop us any way, shape, or form. Oh, that's incredible. Tobacco is not evil. Fighting tooth and nail for 50 years to sell tobacco to children. That's their whole battle. The whole tobacco fight was to keep selling tobacco to children. That's evil. Video games are not evil. There's nothing at all wrong with adults playing video games unless they get in the way of your sleep or your family, your job. But, but fighting all the way to the Supreme Court, uh, lying and misrepresenting to, to sell any game to any kid at any age, that, that's evil. That's where we are. Latin America is being eaten alive with, with violence. Uh, 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 nobody pops across the border to Mexico for a meal and shopping anymore. Uh, all of Latin America is a howling war zone. Uh, Europe, as of 2003, Europe stopped reporting their crime data to Interpol. We have no idea how bad it is. It was up, up, up. And then in 2003, it was so bad they censored the data and no longer report the information. I can't find it. But uh, and in America, in the last two years, every year, year after year, the number of people murdered has been coming down because of medical technology. And then in the last two years, we had the most astounding increase in homicides in the history of our nation. We have never seen anything like this. Two years straight. I show the graph to people and I tell them if this had been the stock market, we'd be in the news every week. If, I, if I, two years straight, homicide rate has exploded, and the, and the media story is, wow, well, you, you can't say anything with two years. You, you know, two years of data, you can't say anything. In the stock market, it'd be everywhere. But the, the message is there is no bad guy out there. Our problem is the cops, and, and, and you don't have to carry a gun, and you don't, there is no bad guy. There is a bad guy out there, and, and cops are not the problem. They're doing the best they can. They're the best people we got, the best trained we've ever had, doing the best they can with an extraordinarily difficult circumstance. We've... We created this de development. The FBI calls it the Ferguson effect. Like we, we, we've created a, a sense of anger in our criminals, like somehow the cop's the bad guy for enforcing the law. These are these just three bad times. And, and, and the only thing that a rational man would do in these times is to dedicate themselves to protecting their part of the world. And I think for all of our veterans of war, we look at this situation as we love our family, as we love our nation. And we've got to be prepared to defend our, our ourselves on this side of the house, too. I, I think it's a right and reasonable thing to do. I do the same thing in my church. Uh, uh, like I said, you know, you have that fire sprinkler and that fire exit and the fire alarm. What have we done to protect this group of individuals from violence? And somehow it, it, half the price of a modern building goes in a fire code. Not, not even talking about what, they, you know, the fire alarm wiring throughout the whole civilization, the fire hydrants and those big pipes that run through our whole civilization. <laughs> We'll spend vast resources and infrastructure on preparing for fire. But when it comes to violence, somehow we're offended that we have to do it. Well, violence throughout history goes up and it goes down. And we're in a period of time in which it goes up. Uh, as we love our nation, as we love our God, as we love our way of life, I think we got to recognize that the mission continues over here. Your skills and your competence. There's nobody on earth we would rather have armed and ready than a veteran of 17 years of war. Uh, these guys uh, have, have fought for our nation over there, and they've got all the capacity to take our part of the world and make it safe over here. For every one of these multiple homicides in houses of worship, I'll show you case after case after case where they were stopped. Somebody tackled them, somebody shot them, somebody stopped it, and, and it never gets in the news. Well, you know, Parkland, the, this cop didn't go in. I'll give you a dozen cases this year where the cop did go in and, and the crime was stopped and it never even got in the news. Uh, so just be be conscious that, that the good news doesn't get reported. The times when uh, people are there and they tackle the bad guy, they take action, uh, that the, the battle continues over here. We, well, my latest book, Assassination Generation, uh, outlines that dynamic and outlines a long-term solution. We defeated the tobacco industry when my second grade teacher told us cigarettes kill people. I went home and hid my dad's cigarettes. You know, that, that generation, they became the juries and the judges and the 
and the voters who leashed in the tobacco industry. We didn't ban tobacco. We're not going to ban media violence. I was saying it. Don't sell this stuff to children. And uh, and uh, uh, the TV turnoff curriculum, Stanford Med School, it's called the www.takethechallengenow.net. It's a TV turnoff curriculum. It's taken off like a grass fire across France, across Canada, across America. We detox for 10 days, turn off TV, movie, and video games, entire school district for 10 days, cut violence in half, cut bullying in half, reduce obesity. The National Institutes of Health have called this the single most effective obesity reduction program in juveniles ever demonstrated and raised test scores double digits. Uh, they're not sleep deprived. They're not being bullied. They're not being attacked. Of course, their test scores are going up. So it's it's in the book. Uh, at the end of the book is the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, we'll never build enough prisons to solve this problem. We'll never medicate enough people to solve this problem. But the teacher in the classroom is educating a generation, and they're going to grow up and unleash in this industry and lead us home from this dark and tragic place which we travel. But in the meanwhile, we got a lot of bad years in front of us before we turn this thing around. And and all of us got to belly up to the bar and accept our responsibility over here as well as there. Yes, sir. Yeah. And discussing this with my brother, he had a you know, his recommendation, he, he took, he took the approach that we need to strengthen our communities and, and kind of like the, the, the parkland killer who you mentioned, the neighbors saw it come in and, you know, it's, it's that moment of intervention when someone can walk across the street and, and, and tighten together, uh, you know, just like in a, just like in a formation here in the army where we can lean on each other. And, and I think that's a good answer. I, I don't necessarily have the, the path or the course to make it happen, but I, I feel like that's a more solid answer than everyone, uh, you know, digging in deeper wherever they're at. You know, when when they came to arrest Jesus, when the lawful authority came to arrest him and one of his disciples pulled out a sword, he said, no, you know, don't hold the sword up against lawful authority. You, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. But in Luke twenty two thirty six, one of the last things Jesus told his disciples, he said, I, I told you before, don't even take your cloak with you. Now I tell you, sell your cloak and buy a sword. What would Jesus do? One of the last things he told us to do is arm ourselves. Luke 22, 36. Oh, that's not my Bible. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And uh, and uh, and as as these violent times come upon us, we've been told uh, what to do. And that is uh, uh, to protect those who we love. Love always protects. And the book of Corinthians, love always protects. If we love the people we worship with, if we love our family, then we'll, as we love our nation, then we dedicate ourselves to protecting it uh, not just now, but, uh, but in the years to come when, when we, we come back from the battlefield and, and they still need our skills to protect. Well, this is, uh, this is great, sir. I really appreciate the chat. Uh, and, you know, my, my favorite quote of the last year that I picked up uh, from Tim Ferriss's uh, podcast was by Archilochus in the 6th century. You know, he said, we don't rise to the level of our expectations. We fall to the level of our training. And, and that resonates and it's on the wall in my, in my battalion area as a reminder. And, and what I appreciate over the years, um, you know, after your, your career in the army, you went on to continue to serve the military and serve law enforcement to help prepare, you know, combat professionals for the, the moment of truth. And so we, we, re, we just really appreciate what you've invested in the profession and in uh, soldiers and police out there, sir. And, and we really appreciate it. And thank you for taking the time today. Um, wh where can folks go to get more of your work, sir? You know, my, my primary website is uh, killology.com, K-I-L-L-O-L-O-G-Y.com. And it's got the links to everything else we got going on out there. But that was very kind of your brother. As, as iron sharpens iron, is what the Bible says, so do uh, so it is. So it is one good warrior uphold the continents of another. As iron sharpens iron. So God bless and uh, and, and thank you for your service here in the, in the heart of war across all these years. Thank you so much, sir. You have a have a great weekend. Thanks, sir. Wow, what a powerful conversation! I hope you got as much out of that as I did, and I encourage you to check out On Killing and On Combat as the definitive guides to the combat experience. I've included a link in the show notes if you want to grab those books on Amazon. All right, that wraps up the first season of the Military Leader Podcast. I think it was a heck of a start. Huge thanks to all the leaders who joined me to share their thoughts and make better leaders of all of us here on the podcast. And I want to personally thank you for being a part of the Military Leader community. Remember to check out the website for new leader development articles and be sure to share them freely with your team. What's up next on the podcast? Well, I'm reaching out to leaders right now, and I'll be sure to bring you the most successful, inspirational, and proven leaders I can find. And I'll take any and all suggestions. So if you know of a particularly effective leader who would be a great guest for the show, go ahead and shoot me an email at drew at themilitaryleader.com, 
or hit me on social media. I'd love to hear your suggestion. Thanks again for all you do to become a better leader, to grow your team. It matters. Remember, the views expressed here do not represent the Department of Defense or U.S. government in any way. Thanks for listening and lead well.